uh, thank you for inviting a representative society um, to come and address your conference. Um, at uh, 29, I'm one of the youngest members of the council. Uh, we've got um, council members that stretch from, from me all the way to people uh, in their 70s. Uh, let me say a little bit more about church society just to get an idea of the perspective with which I'm going to address you from. Uh, our earliest forebear is the Protestant Association, uh, which began in 1835. In the 19th century, um, we were involved in tackling the rise of Catholic theology in the Church of England, and in the 20th century, uh, the rise of liberal theology. Our journal, The Churchman, which uh, you made reference to, is over 100 years old, um, and provides conservative theology, which is both aimed to be academic and pastoral, uh, from its perspective. Through our trust, the Church Society Trust, we have influence in the appointment of ministers in over 100 parishes around the country. And we're involved with Westminster politics. You may have heard of the Keep Marriage Special campaign. Uh, we're we're uh, quite involved with that. Members of our council are involved on that. And we also contribute a lot of uh, money towards it. And we're involved in uh, church and politics both at the synod level and locally. So our work takes place both at the national level and the local level. We are quite a broad uh, organisation um, in uh, terms of what we do and the kind of things that we're involved with. We have our fingers in many pies, becoming our, um, our, our slogan. Um, and there are many points of connection, I think, with um, uh, some of the values and concerns of the traditional Britain group and the quarterly review. So I commend uh, thinking about the society to you if you've never heard of us. Now, having introduced the society, let me please introduce my theme for this morning. The Church of England, should it remain established? The Church of England, should it remain established. Church Society was invited to address your conference because apparently some of you feel that the Church of England should be disconnected from its privileged role in British government. It's an opinion that I can understand and empathise with. Okay. Increasingly the Church of England appears liberal, socialist, progressive or regressive, as we might want to label that, out of touch, unchristian and unbelieving. What's the point of it? Rather than being a force for maintaining the traditional structures of our society, the Church of England is contributing to the erosion of traditional structures, such as the family unit. Uh, for example, the Church has uh, denied the equally valuable but distinct roles of men and women in its marriage vows now, in its introduction of female presbyters, and in its likely introduction of female bishops, going on at the moment in Synod. And it's this denial of the distinction between the sexes which is inevitably leading to uh, calls to redefine the institution of marriage altogether. If men and women are seen as completely indistinct in their roles and who they are, and completely interchangeable, then it's no surprise that many presbyters and even some bishops are seemingly in support of gay marriage and willing to bless civil partnerships. Now, don't get me wrong, okay? I am a, a pastor after all, so I want to offer a, a pastoral perspective on uh, those, those issues. I think women are very valuable, and their ministry is very valuable. A large, conservative evangelical church in the city of London, for example, employs 13 women in non-administrative roles. That's a higher percentage per head employee than in any of the surrounding banks or buildings. It employs more women than all the rest of the churches in the deanery put together. It's a very conservative, classical church. So women are valued, and their ministry in this church is valued. But none of them take on the role of presbyter, because the roles they play in the church reflect the biblical pattern, um, as, as it said in the scriptures, of the family and the genders. And of course everyone's welcome in church as well, I want to say, gay and straight alike. Let me clarify, the Bible never condemns gay people. I trained as an actor uh, originally before I went to the ministry. I have a lot of friends um, it, you know, who are gay or mixed in those circles a lot. What God says in the Bible is that the best and right place for sexual relationship is within heterosexual marriage. The Bible tells us that everyone, including me, gets things wrong. You know, I struggle with lust, I struggle with the other nine commandments as well. You know, this is the sort of thing I tell people from the church all the time at the front. But I'm welcome in church because the Christian gospel offers me forgiveness. And Jesus gives me his spirit to transform my heart and make me different. So everyone is welcome because we're all sinners in need of forgiveness. However... That is not license to deny that my sin is wrong, nor to redefine the nature of marriage. Now that pastoral explanation of the classic Christian teaching on ethics 
and the traditional model of the family is not something I hear from the Church of England very much. I might get the odd snippet. Sometimes someone holds their head above the parapet, but that's not what I hear. Instead, the Church of England increasingly has bought into the spirit of the age, and they want to say stuff which will just be popular with their perceived people on the street to think. In a misunderstanding of the nature of equality, the C of E has denied that men and women can have distinct roles at all. Um, but being equal does not mean being the same, would be the pastoral, classical, biblical answer to that. And, and by assuming that men and women are identical, it's not surprising that uh, they are increasingly treated as just completely interchangeable. And hence that's why we get the argument now, the theological, the philosophical and pastoral arguments made that um, you should be able to replace any member of a marriage with, with someone of the opposite gender. That's where the argument is coming from. This is the kind of thinking which is increasing in prominence in the Church of England. The C of E is increasingly a liberal and liberalising institution. It's not just liberal, but it's promoting liberal values. Uh, it's seeking to question and undermine traditional values, which itself undermines traditional institutions, like marriage and the family. And this liberalising institution, the Church of England, is sewn into the fabric of our society, at the very core, at the very heart of it. And so I can understand why many of you may wish to see the back of it. You don't like it. It doesn't seem to be helping very much. But I want to argue with you this morning, if I may, that jettisoning the Church of England will do the country no favours. I'm going to argue that with you by asking you to reflect for a moment on your understanding of change and tradition, your philosophy of change and tradition. In other words, I'm going to ask you to consider what is the core and what is the husk of traditional Britain. Everyone has a philosophy of tradition, which is itself a philosophy of change. Let me explain what I mean. If you're someone who wishes to maintain tradition, then that necessarily means that the world around you is changing, isn't it? Otherwise, why would you need to maintain tradition if it wasn't under threat, if it wasn't being eroded? So, the maintenance of tradition implies that uh, erosion and change is ongoing. And what is tradition then, in this context of change? What is tradition? I'm, I'm no sociologist, I apologise to those of you who are, because uh, I'm going to offer a layman's definition, if I may, um, of, of tradition, just for the sake of my address. Tradition is, as I'm going to define it, the values, institutions, networks and rituals which constitute our socio-cultural identity. Okay, again, I'm sorry, layman's definition, I'm not a sociologist, that's the best I can do. Uh, and it is for this reason that tradition is so central to the identity and function of any society. The values, institutions, networks and rituals which make up the tradition we wish to maintain are intimately connected to every aspect of our daily lives. Let me give you an example from my youngest, uh, Seth, who is two. Um, and already he has a clear understanding, say, of the difference between boys and girls. He can play rough and tumble with his mates, uh, but he, must, uh, he knows he must be more gentle and respectful um, to his female friends. He's two, and he understands that already. He also understands uh, that different behaviours are required for different settings. And so he knows he can throw the toys around and mess around on my living room floor. But when he's sitting in church, or when he's sitting in preschool, he knows to sit quietly. Okay? The kind of institutions, and the rituals, and the networks that he's involved with, have already taught him, at the age of two, how to behave properly in different settings. I think that's incredible. That is brilliant. That's what tradition does. He understands his place, and he knows how to behave in his place in a right way, respectful of other people. The values, institutions, networks and rituals that constitute our tradition and our culture directly impact every aspect of life. They directly impact my two-year-old son. And hence they form the framework and the structures necessary for my two-year-old to learn how to behave well. The problem, however, is this. Precisely because tradition is connected to everything, because it's connected to every aspect of our daily lives, as the world around us changes, the traditions we wish to maintain must undergo change. Necessary. Because there is always something changing, and tradition is connected to everything. Take, for example, the British countryside. I'm sure that all of us here value our countryside greatly. It is brilliant. It's great. I want to protect it. Um, 
However, what does that mean for your attitudes to developments in farm technology? What does that mean? Um, all of us would want to see the countryside protected, but we're not Amish peasants, are we? Okay, and we'll all allow for tractors, and we'll allow for uh, combine harvesters, or cedars, or, or other technology to be used to, to maintain that farming on an economically viable basis. At the same time, I would take it that many here will consider traditional skills, such as horsemanship, to be very important, and traditional forms of pest control, perhaps, such as fox hunting, to be important as well. Tradition is connected to every aspect of our lives, and daily lives are constantly changing, but this raises a problem in the countryside. And that problem is, what is it that you will allow the countryside to develop and change in, and what is it that you wish to maintain? So if this is true, change is happening all the time, and tradition is connected to everything, it leaves you with this problem, this question, at some point you need to decide what it is about tradition that you wish to keep. Traditionists are constantly faced with that challenge of deciding what the core of their tradition is and what is the husk that we're happy to say uh, this, this can fall away or change under the circumstances. Why are horsemanship and fox hunting worth saving and they're part of the core of the countryside we want to protect but hand and ox drawn plows are not something that we want to maintain and will allow modern developments in farming. Coises a North American Christian social scientist puts this in very straightforward terms when he describes the conservative dilemma that we have. In a world of change, the big question facing all conservatives is this. What is it that we wish to conserve? What is it that we wish to conserve? Now, Coises takes us a step further again, actually, and he argues that the question reveals something about the nature of conservatism itself. The point he makes is this, conservatism is not itself an ideology. Conservatism is not in and of itself an ideology. You see, an ideology such as mine, evangelical, Protestant and Anglican, is a fixed set of ideas, hence the term ideology. The 13 articles summarise them up well. Um, articles 1 to 5 give the substance of that ideology, uh, the Trinity, one God and three persons. The second person, the Son of God, becomes man, dies and rises again. Article 6 to 8 give the rule of that ideology. The Bible is God's word and man's ultimate authority. It contains everything needed for salvation. Articles 9 to 18 give the personal implications of that theology. I'm a sinner, I trust in Jesus, and I'm saved from my sin. And Articles 19 to 39 give the corporate life of that ideology. The church, the ministry, the sacraments, the Bible are all there to point me to faith in Christ. Now that's an ideology because it's a fixed set of beliefs. That's why Cranmer wrote them down, because he wanted them to be fixed. Evangelical Protestant and Anglican means the same thing in any time, any place, or it's supposed to. That's what Cranmer uh, was trying to do. In contrast, conservatism as a label is not an ideology in the same sense. Conservatism is the attitude that wishes to conserve something that already exists. And so, according this argues, whether you're a conservative or a liberal does depend upon where you are and when you are. It's a relative term in many respects. So in the UK, I'm a conservative because I value freedom of speech and thought, I value individual privacy and freedom, I value a free market. In the UK, those are pre-existing values developed from my Christian heritage which I wish to conserve. But in, I don't know, somewhere like Iran or Saudi Arabia, I might be labelled a liberal for holding some of those views. Because their inherited tradition is different. And the things they value are different. So if conservatism is not itself an ideology in the same way that evangelical Protestant and Anglican is, it's not in and of itself connected to a fixed set of ideas. And that means that in a world of change, the conservative attitude doesn't in and of itself make sense unless it is coupled with a consistent underlying ideology. That is how you make sense of a conservative attitude. When deciding what it is that you wish to conserve, when deciding what it is that's the core and the husk of the tradition is, you have to ask yourself, what is it that I really believe? And how can I believe that consistently? Now, Archbishop Cranmer recognised the crucial importance of this question, actually. It's right at the beginning of the English prayer book. He begins by discussing it when he writes this. It hath been the wisdom of the Church of England ever since the first compiling of their public liturgy 
to keep the mean between two extremes, of too much stiffness in refusing, and of too much easiness in admitting any variation from it. In other words, at the English Reformation, Cranmer acknowledges, right at the beginning of his project, that you must maintain tradition, but at the same time allow for the reality of ongoing change. He describes this as keeping the mean between two extremes. And then Cranmer goes on to explain the conservative rationale for being suspicious of change. He says this, For as on the one side common experience showeth that where a change hath been made of things advisedly established, no evident necessity so requiring, sundry inconveniences have thereupon ensued, and those many times more and greater than the evils that were intended to be remedied by some change. I wonder if we can look around our country anywhere and see where people have fiddled with things that didn't need to be filled with, and we can see sundry inconveniences that have ensued from it. I think we can. In other words, if, you, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, is what Cranmer said, right at the beginning of the life of the Church of England. If there's no good reason to change something, then don't. Just leave it alone. It's fine. Most of the time, you just generate, generate worse problems <coughs> by doing so. I believe a form of this argument will be made probably by most speakers here today. At the same time, Cranmer allows for the judicious and wise application of change. So on the other side, he says, the particular forms of divine worship and the rites and ceremonies appointed to be used therein, being things in their own nature indifferent and alterable and so acknowledged, it is but reasonable and upon weighty and important considerations, according to the various exigency of times and occasions, such changes and alterations should be made therein as for those that are in place of authority should from time to time seem either necessary or expedient. So Cranmer does allow for change, but listen to his language in doing so. He wishes it to be reasonable, which means that the reasons to consider change must be weighty and important. He recognises that such weighty and important reasons for change uh, would, would come on account of the various exigency of times and occasions. Change should not be an individual's prerogative, but should be a corporate decision made by those in authority. And the bar for accepting change is set very high. Is a suggested change necessary? Is it expedient? If it's not, don't bother, Cranmer says. So it seems to me on my reading of the prayer book that Cranmer adopts a philosophy of change and tradition and a methodological approach that is in the best sense conservative, if I may say. But of course, since conservatism is not itself an ideology, as I've argued, that leaves us with the question, how does Cranmer separate the core from the husk? How does he decide what to protect and what to allow to change? As a conservative, how does he decide what to conserve? Well, Cranmer goes on in his preface, and he describes how it is they made the decision to accept certain changes and not to do so. And then he says, but we are fully persuaded about these changes that the book, as it stood before established by law, doth not contain in it anything contrary to the word of God or to sound doctrine, or which a godly man may not with a good conscience use and submit unto, or which is not fairly defensible against any that shall oppose the same. And it shall be allowed such just and favourable construction as in common equity ought to be allowed to all. Now let me unpack that for you a little bit and its dense language. Cranmer stresses in the strongest possible terms that the ultimate source of ideology, the ultimate arbiter as far as he's concerned, of what to conserve and what to, what to change, comes from the word of God. Listen to the emphasis he puts on that point. He describes at the beginning. He says all changes, by what persons, under what pretenses, to <coughs> what purpose soever, that they be so tended. It, it doesn't matter, he says, in other words, it doesn't matter who made the change, or when they made it, or what purpose they made it for uh, uh, initially, the decision for keeping a change or not, or making a change, is made on the basis of what seems to fit with God's word in the Bible. Yes, Cranmer acknowledges that the prayer book is just a human piece of writing, but it has been given to the country by people in authority, which he considers important, and it's put together in light of the very best translations of the Holy Scripture itself. And Cranmer's understanding of what that Holy Scripture says is laid out in the 39 articles, which I summarised for you earlier. Cranmer is a conservative. He draws his ideology from the Bible. 
And the ideology he finds there is evangelical Protestant and Anglican, as described in the 13 articles. That is the core, or it should be, of the English church. That is how the English church decides, or should, should decide, what to keep and what it can allow to change. Friends, can I please commend Cranmer's reasoning to you? The Church of England has become a liberalising institution, precisely because the Church has forgotten its moorings in Scripture and the Protestant faith that it teaches. The Church doesn't know what it stands for anymore. And that's why it's gone so soft. The state is increasingly liberal, and our inherited tradition is decaying, it seems to me. But I, I would argue that's precisely also because we are increasingly forgetting our moorings in Scripture and the Protestant faith that our country has been built on for centuries. However, if you seek to solve this problem by disestablishing the Church of England, you'll only serve to accelerate this decline, I believe, not to remedy it. I would argue, and I would, I'm a vicar, okay, the solution is for the Church, the country, and the Conservative Party to put the Bible and the Protestant faith back at the centre of what they do. Only then will we rightly identify the core and the husk, and only then will we protect the substance of our inherited tradition, what has made Britain great. Now let me try and unpack some of this argument for you from a real world example. Take Boris Johnson's argument in the Telegraph last week when he described marriage as being a relic of the Stone Age. Okay? A relic of the Stone Age. Johnson's well known for being a keen monarchist as well. Well, monarchy was the earliest form of government. And Neolithic tribes were either ruled in Britain, Neolithic tribes in Britain were either ruled by a tribal chief or had some system of collective decision making. I'm not, I'm not a Neolithic expert, so I don't know. But that seems to be um, uh, what uh, my reading tells me. So something like democracy and something a bit like monarchy are also Stone Age relics. Yes, they've changed over time, but so has marriage. The point is, my friends, is just because marriage is a relic of the Stone Age, does that make it wrong now? Because it doesn't seem to apply to monarchy, does it? Boris Johnson would admit that. We can keep the monarch, even though she's a relic of the Stone Age. A great one! A brilliant one! Keep it! Same thing goes for marriage. How does he decide what to keep and what to get rid of? How does he decide it? What is the ideology underlying his conservatism? Because, friends, it is possible to be a conservative and have no ideology underlying it and to just run with the spirit of the age and just to make decisions about what's the core and what's the husk completely inconsistently. And you can look very conservative while you do that. But I would argue you do need a robust ideology underneath whatever it is that you, you believe. Conservatism is not itself an ideology. It's a methodology, a great methodology, that the founder of my church put down in uh, the formularies of, of my denomination. Both the church and the state need to reclaim their biblical Protestant ideology. Currently, that ideology is at least enshrined in the constitutional makeup in the establishment of the church um, and, uh, and her Protestant formularies. So at least it's there, even if it doesn't seem to be in many other places in the church at the moment. But let me ask you, if you're calling for the disestablishment of the church, and we believe it should happen, then I'd argue what ideology do you expect to replace it in the country? What ideology would you put in Christianity's place? Would you put Islam in its place? Would you put the New Atheism in its place? Would you put Buddhism or Hinduism in its place? Now, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to go into sort of detail um, giving up the of Christianity over and above those worldviews, but I would argue this. The Christian ideology has one thing over and above them, and that is that it has proven itself in the history of our country. It has proven itself to be valuable and worth it. I've argued that conservatism is a philosophy of tradition and change, not an ideology in and of itself. I've argued the C of E in its formularies has such a conservative philosophy of change. But conservatism needs that ideological underpinning, and the best underpinning for it is the Christian heritage bequeathed to us by our ancestors. The underlying ideology of the English church and of the English state has been the Protestant religion 
as taught in the Christian scriptures. And so I'd encourage you to keep reading your Bibles. Thank you. I'd encourage you to keep reading your Bibles, to do so, okay, and to go to your Anglican church and encourage its growth. Thank you very much.